Welcome to Tinfoil Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumors, all with almost believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it is totally founded in logic, reason, and truth. Or not. Who knows? Let's get started on the latest race and work out whether we got anything right. First of all, let's have some do-overs, I think is the most important part here. Because it's basically the same predictions that we had for Imola. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, well, we didn't have Imola, so we just moved, carried our predictions forward. Exactly. So uh, the first here is Mark's, uh, Merck's Imola upgrades will barely be visible and will have no effect on the performance of the car relative to the rest of the field. Uh, I think this was true. I do think, yes, you could claim you could see them, they were visible, but they weren't really visible. Um, and so at the end of the day, I'm going to say that you couldn't really see them, and it really have an effect on performance because they finished basically where they were going to finish anyway. Ahead of Ferrari? Yes, exactly. Hmm. Not sure about that. Uh, I also predicted rain. They, they like, did finish ahead of Ferrari. They did, did finish they ahead, but but they they did not necessarily qualify ahead of Ferrari, so they made up some pace. But we can talk about qualifying in a minute because qualifying sure. was brilliant. Um, sure. Was there rain? I was surprised at how yes. little rain there was, given kind of the forecast when we originally recorded the podcast. But like, and it was blue, sunny skies during qualifying, and then the rain came in on Sunday and actually produced just a little bit of. Uh, made monaco just a little bit interesting there it did i was surprised because i was what it was all like oh it's gonna rain on saturday and sunday and then and then it disappeared and then it actually rained i was surprised i was not i was expecting it to be that monaco where it's like oh it's looking cloudy here comes some rain we're gonna get and then nothing happened but it did in fact deliver i was all ready to lead off the podcast with i watched a brilliant race today and it was the indy 500 you can still lead with that though. Uh, it yeah, but really a great race. Yeah, we'll we'll get to Indy. We we have some I have some thoughts on that. Uh, but I think we need to move on to our uh, occasional segment that happens every podcast of Does Blank still have a job? Uh, Nick DeVries starting off our list. He didn't bin it. He did not bin it. No, he did not bin it. He actually, and he beat Yuki. He qualified well. Yuki kind of beat himself in that scenario. Um, he he took like forty seconds to reverse out of the longest uh, reversing lane in Monaco. So. Yeah, but you know he didn't hit anybody yeah. in the process of of doing that, unlike some other drivers who I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, so Indeed. you know, I I don't think it's going to save his job, but it, he didn't. Uh, he wasn't the worst driver on the grid today. That is that is fair. That's true. It's given him one more race. Yeah, uh, Zach Brown. I'm gonna say he's safe for now. Uh, McLaren had a good result. Uh, at uh, Monaco, they actually did pretty good. They were both in the points, and Piastri wasn't that far behind Norris. Yes, but do you know where Zach Brown was today? Indica. Zach Brown was on the wall at the Indy 500. And, you know, did did Mc, did one of the McLaren errors take the win at the Indy 500? No, but they were protagonists all throughout the race. It looked like it was going really well their way for a while, and then the chaos of the last 15 or so laps just kind of let them down. So I think IndyCar is going to save Zach Brown's job, and I think it still will because, you know, they, they had a good result. They definitely stepped up from some of their previous years. It's I think it's looking good for, for McLaren and IndyCar, and I think if they're trying to sell more road cars to Americans, you want to do well at IndyCar. Yes, that would make sense. Uh, there is there is also the, the third option here, that Zach Brown keeps his job as the head of McLaren Racing, but McLaren F1 is sold to someone else. Uh, well, there was some very interesting news about a uh, sponsor moving around the grid. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but... Uh, I saw Alfa Romeo moving to Haas, rumored yep. to be. Yep, so, rumored. Which, you know. And what, uh, Salba's going to be by Audi? Salba. Well, for, until 2026, it will be Salba. And then... Apparently, it's just going to be runner Salba. And then it, when the engine comes in, then it will be Audi. Gotcha. I do, I do wonder how Ferrari is going to deal with the fact that Saba will have access to the Ferrari engine. What that means, given that Audi owns what sixty percent of Saba now, but I don't understand these these things. And well, corporate, uh, corporate contracts are different. I mean, isn't Audi owned by a Volkswagen Group? Yes. Yeah, so they're well away with how to cheat emis- or how to cheat scandals in your engines <laughs> in order to to make things work better. This will be fantastic. It's a great pairing. It's part of the co- corporate DNA. Yeah, they they know how to cheat the system. They've done it before. Yeah. Uh, Otmar, I I think the Monaco podium might save him. I did notice that there was a comment during the final few laps where it was pointed out that uh, 
the commentary will be like, see, this is what happens when you get a dressing down. The team turns it around and sorts it out. I should have shouted at them earlier. Um, I, I, I don't know whether that podium is based on merit or based on luck. Uh, Alcon was really up there in qualifying. Like, he put together a really good qualifying performance. Like, you know, especially at Monaco, you know, starting near the front is very helpful because you look at, like, Perez, and, yeah, he did, like, five more pit stops than anybody else. Uh, you know, he would, he went nowhere and that's the best car on the grid. He was trapped behind the, the, Logan Sargent and the Williams for forever. I know because it's Monaco and once you've got position, it doesn't matter. You can't get rid of it. It's, that's right. what, that's, that's your the hand, the hand that you've been dealt. But here's the thing without getting into qualifying. I don't think qualifying was representative of every car's performance. Ooh, that's, uh, well, yeah. I mean, when none of the lap is run at full throttle, that's probably true. Um, indeed. But we can talk about that in a minute. Um, I would like to add something new to this list. Uh, who gets fired first, Lance or uh, Aston Martin's tire picker? Is it Aston Martin's tire picker every week, or is it just Lance every week? It's a good question. Because because uh, he did is is the, is the tire picker Aston Martin really that bad? Well, you know, it's raining, falling from the sky. Let's put on mediums. True, but that's that's one time. I'm amazed they got away with that. Like they essentially did a double pit stop and got away with it. Yeah, it was it was the, the 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 gap worked, and I think it was actually the rain that let them get away with that because they pitted at the wrong time, but that meant that they were offset from everybody else, and then everybody else was slipping and sliding all the way down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, between race, race drama, let's uh, let's move on just briefly. We're... Yeah, it was a short week yeah. uh, with the late-breaking episode we did last time and the rumor of uh, Lewis going to Ferrari. Uh, there has been strong denials by everybody that Ferrari hadn't, won't be, definitely can't send Hamilton a deal and that Merck will unquestionably get the deal done. To me, this reads full of corporate, the lady doth protest too much, and in fact, it's already a done deal and it will be announced mid-season. Uh, yeah, definitely, uh, at the, uh, with the driver's press conference on Thursday was the, Charles, who's your ideal teammate? Oh, hi, Lewis. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely some of that going around. But that was the only bit, bit of between waste drama. Not a lot happened in the last week. No, I think everybody so, was, the, Imola didn't give us, uh, any good stories to, to chat about. Indeed. So shall we go on to the race? I, except of, of course, how great Yuki Sonoda is and how we should just, I'll be Yuki fan. Yes. Yuki is great. Anyway. <laughs> Shall we go on to the race? Uh, well, first, I think we have to talk about qualifying, because I thought qualifying was absolutely brilliant. It was really exciting, but I do question whether it was truly representative of everybody's performance. And I'm also not willing to subscribe to the fact that everybody was like, oh, it was all jumbled up because of the track evolution. I get that that's what happened to a certain extent early on, but later on, I, I, there was something else going on, and I wasn't quite what it, quite sure what it was. To me, the the brilliant bit of qualifying was was Lewis Hamilton showing us why he is indeed the seven time brilliant world champion that he is, because he was in the drop zone in Q one on old tires, and pretty much you have to go now, uh, and he got through. And then in Q two, he was in the drop zone and had somebody ruin his last fast lap, and he had to back off halfway through the lap, reset the car, and then go again, and made it into Q three. Lewis like Lewis did a great job and that was very fun to watch on on Saturday. The problem is is that's the best we got out of Lewis all weekend. I mean he did beat George. Barely. Only because George screwed up. Anyway, let's continue with qualifying yeah, before but we get into the race. You know who didn't screw uh, up Lewis? I don't know. I, I, I think he, he 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 could have done better than he did. Anyway, we'll come to that when we talk about the race. Yeah. Let's talk about qualifying. Uh, Perez, I, I thought it was interesting that yeah, Perez botched it. He did. He bish botched it on. Was it like his second lap? Yeah, it was. Lap? Yeah, no, no it, it must it, have it, been. It must have been late. He was his second fast lap. Yeah, and I think because he put a time in. Yeah, um, what Crofty and Martin were saying that they think he got distracted by the car that was coming out of the pit lane at the time. Break too late, just slapped the wall, showed everybody the underside of his car via a crane. Um, fantastic news for everybody else's development to see exactly how the Red Bull works underneath. Yes, everybody did that. It was it was definitely the collective people dropping their trousers to let everybody see the bottom of the car. They basically mooned the entire field. 
between Ferrari and uh, Mercedes and Red Bull. Uh, but yeah, Perez screwed that up, binned it. I think he was unsure about which lap he was really on and he thought he was in Q3 and got confused and thought he was going to get on pole. And then he just accidentally did it in Q1. Whoopsie. Whoopsie. Uh, I thought it was interesting uh, in Max's post-race interview that he said he just basically sent it and was hoping for the best. And in hindsight, I wonder if it was exactly the same as that guy in NASCAR who just wall, wall ran the car round the final corner to get the win so he could carry the speed. It felt a little bit like uh, that Max had done that as he basically floored it and bounced off the wall like a ping pong ball. Yeah, I think Max knew exactly how to bounce off those walls because you bounce off them a little too hard and you are going to break your suspension. But it was definitely a uh, last lap, all or nothing. You know, we're going to we're going to touch the walls here and there to, to get the speed we need to carry it through. Did you did you happen to see the uh, the overlay uh, graphic that was going around on Twitter of uh, Alonzo versus uh, Max's last laps? I did. I saw the at least the video overlay where they did them corner by corner and you could see it and it was like Max slowly but surely gapping backwards and backwards further and further behind Alonso until that last sector and then it was like Yep. Yep. Like yep. a rocket ship. Yeah, I saw the um like the digital recreation version where it kind of shows them on like their lines and everything and yeah, Max definitely made a mistake like I think in turn one, Sandabot. Uh but then like just made up for it in sector three. And... Yeah, it was it was very impressive, very impressive. Yeah, I do wonder whether it's repeatable. Uh, well, Charles will certainly try and break a tie rod or something. <laughs> Indeed. What else did we have going on? Uh, we've got a lot Alonso getting Ferrari'd. Well, to finish up on qualifying and kind of talking about Lance Stroll, he was at the very back. He didn't. He screwed that one up. His car was damaged, apparently. He hit something and the floor was damaged early in the qualifying, and that's why he couldn't do it. Yeah, that sounds like how you screw up your car and don't get out of Q1. True. Norris did a pretty good job. He banged his car up and got it fixed in time. Yeah, those mechanics did a great job getting him into Q3. That was impressive to watch. That was a seven seven minutes for a 20-minute job. Why yeah. can't they do that when I take my car for a service? Uh, book pricing. Mm, there you go. Maybe I should buy a McLaren. Maybe that's what that would get me. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure they. Uh, yeah, just don't look at the, that bill. I'm sure that will not be an expensive yeah. bill to fix. Um, but Indeed. Yeah, but I think the the end of qualifying was really great with uh, what Gasly looking like or Charles looking like he was going to be on pole, and then yep. Fernando came along and looked like he was going to be on pole, and then Max came along and he was on pole. It was really interesting, but I still feel that there was. Something else going on there that in introduced that slightly random number generator effect that uh, you don't normally see in qualifying. Like you normally see the it, like the, the the strata of the cars normally fills out, and I'm trying to work out exactly what about this year at Monaco made that difference. There was Did a comment from Williams that the tires apparently were going off extremely quickly, and I do wonder whether in hindsight that was playing into it. Like some people had got their tires just right. I wonder if this is, instead of seeing the order of the cars, we actually saw the order of the drivers. I will subscribe to that theory. I can believe that. Uh, it's definitely true. In which case, there's an implication there that there's a bunch of drivers who everybody thinks are great. Turns out they're not that great. I mean, we've known that to be the case for some time. But you yes. you, you look at, like, I remember watching one of Max's onboard laps, and it, I was amazed at how little time they spent, like, on the throttle. It, it just seemed yeah. like they were tiptoeing their way around Monaco. Did you see the uh, technical breakdown of the new parts that they were putting on the car, specifically on the Red Bull? They had to change the... There was, there was something to do with the steering specifically because so they could get the full lock for uh, Monaco because no other track required you to turn that tightly, which I thought was interesting. It didn't. None of the other teams listed that specifically, but Red Bull said they had to go change their steering arms so that they could get the appropriate amount of lock. I mean, you optimized the car for most of no, the no, season. Absolutely. It makes sense. Yeah. Oh, absolutely absolutely so the race yeah the race okay it was exciting for 10 laps yeah I, I i will admit i kind of fast forwarded through some of the laps because i wanted to watch the indy 500 live rather than monaco so i was like okay nothing's changing nothing's changing nothing's changing nothing is still changing and then it's like oh there's, I, I watched a lot of like the pit stop action to see like the over and under yeah. sort of stuff. And but as you know, if, if, if the lap happened with nobody changing on the timing charts, there is no reason to really watch any of that lap. Uh, so yeah, it was it was kind of really boring. 
And then... Like Monaco should be. But, yeah. Maybe not should be. And then it, it started raining. And it got really crazy really quick. Yeah, but I was surprised how little it really shook things up. That in is In reality. True. Yeah, in reality, G- it given, didn't do much. Given the number of people that slid off, went sideways, went round corners, spun, gently tapped into other people. Uh, at the end of the day, I think the only people who really shuffled in that order were uh, the Ferraris and George. Yep, the Ferraris went backwards for sure. Carlos Sainz really had a race to forget. He uh, he botched, uh, what, he ruined his front wing early in the race. and Yep. Yeah. Yep. A bit like Perez, who kept driving into the back of people. Yeah, he also did not have a good race. No. The street king is no longer the king. Yeah. Long live the new king. His name is Max. I mean, Max was... I don't want to just come across as like a Max Verstappen fanboy, even though he is one of my favorite drivers on the grid. But man, he put no foot wrong this weekend. He put it on pole exactly how he needed to. He got the start done. He pulled out a gap. Um, You know, Alonso and Max were on different tire strategies, but he made the mediums last for a long to essentially to the rain period and then switched to inners and rode to the end of the race. Like it was i don't think max did anything wrong in this race he he played it tactically perfectly exactly how he needed to it was it was impressive I, to watch I would, I would agree in the race i think in qualifying he left it a little bit late i think in q1 and q2 he had some rough laps that were making it look like he wasn't going to be able to stick it on pole but that's that's kind of a max thing well it only matters of who sets the time first if you tie on time he still went fastest yep 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 um so another max uh superlative race uh, it's very boring um i, I can't wait should, to say we what therefore penalize him yeah i can't wait to see what like uh what the race and all like when everybody does like their top 10 driver ranking or their driver rankings out of 10 and somehow max will still probably get a 9.5 because he didn't get fastest lap or something indeed that went to lewis i believe it, it did go to lewis, lewis. yeah mm-hmm. thanks to the rain what else happened uh I think I briefly talked about Merck and Red Bull and Ferrari showing their um, bottoms to the rest of the world, uh, which I thought was quite funny. Um, It was interesting to read some of the commentary pointing out or or trying to postulate that the Red Bull one was amazing and so much radically different. And if you looked at the three of them, you couldn't tell the difference between them. Like, there's no way unless you were a true, true expert, in which case you worked for an F1 team and therefore weren't commenting on the Internet to be able to tell the difference between those three cars. I am sure Adrian Newey is already out with his tracing paper trying to uh, draw some oh, new yeah, lines absolutely. and see how see where their uh, stra- strat or um to see where their strengths lie and then passing that on to Hannah Schmidt so then they can figure it all out and become even more dominant than they already are. Exactly. George Russell uh you want to talk about George Russell? Let's talk about George Russell. Whiny boy. Whining. Yeah. Whiny boy. And this lots of drivers have done this over the years, and it always irks me, which is let me pass my teammate because I promise you, honest to God, I am faster. And then I promise I won't do something stupid in front of them. I'm like, this is not a title situation. This isn't even a uh, a constructors championship situation where it would make some difference in some way. Uh, and he's just whining and saying, please let me go in front so I don't have to actually keep five seconds. And it just feels like a bunch of porky pies. The moment he did that, he would have been six seconds down the road and gone, ha, 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 ha. whoops, sorry, I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, he, he did a terrible job of backing out of that corner just with George definitely does not seem to care about anybody else on the grid other than George. He is time and time That's again. A true world championship character sure but he has time and time again put that car in places where other people then have accidents yes and, and not I, I mean... and not like a senna oh i'm gonna make you decide whether you're going to have an accident or not no he's just being irresponsible i, I mean the only caveat is it's very difficult to see out of that car and you can't really turn your head and and it's raining. sure And I would argue that Perez already having run into two other people in the race already, maybe he was partially responsible for it. But yes, I do think uh, George should be better. But at least he got a penalty for it, so it's okay. He did get a penalty for it. And then what, Hulkenberg got a penalty for not serving a penalty. Yeah, I missed missed what actually happened. Did he pit and not serve the penalty? I believe so, but when you're down in like 18th, uh, there's not really much to talk about. Does it really matter? Yeah. Yeah, no. Hmm. Uh, there's K-Mag driving around on slicks when he really should have been in to get some different tires, but, you know, 
Haas going to Haas. Except for the race, it was a very boring race. It was, it, it's, it's Monaco, it's boring, nothing happens. It's not, it, 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 it shouldn't be on the calendar. You know, you know what it should be on the, on the calendar for? It should be a qualifying race only that sets it for, I don't know, Monza maybe is a great example where qualifying is just a disaster. It would be perfect for that. Just like, a, you know, a, a six week gap between the qualifying session and the race. Yeah, and then but... they can do the sprint race on the Monza weekend and everything's perfect. But every, but F1 loves Monaco. They love going, the, the F1 itself loves going to Monaco. They love the allure of oh, no. Monaco. It's, it, it's a classic thing. It, it makes sense why they want to go there. I'm, you know, should there almost be a, a spec series car, go-kart almost for Monaco instead of the, the wide cars we have? I'm hoping 2026 fixes this because they're supposedly going to make the cars narrower and they need to make them shorter too. They can't just like squish them in the middle and make them longer. You don't want a lot of pencils going around the track? No, please God, because they'll never make it round Mirabeau. (laughs) No, they probably won't. Or the Lowe's hairpin. No. Or or, or the Anthony Noakes one, or the swimming pool, uh, or Sandoval. So yeah, just generally don't do that. Yeah, sadly, there's just not too much to say about Monaco this time around. Nope. You want to talk about the Indy 500? Okay. You can talk about the Indy 500 because I've seen nothing about the Indy 500. Oh, the Indy 500 was brilliant. It's everything I love in the Indy 500. And why I think the Indy driving 500... Driving around in a circle for four hours? Oh, but so more than driving around in a circle for four hours. It... Mm. So the Indy 500 I thought was a really great race this year. Um, I, I As much as we love talking about like F1 strategy and like, oh, somebody been the strategy, there's... There's very important strategies at IndyCar, and that was made evident, especially today. But like, you still also need luck to get <laughs> to, to have a good job at the race, and it's just that combination makes it very interesting. Uh, until like lap what 180 or so, it was it was relatively clear running. They didn't have the first yellow until lap 90. Um, the Aeros McLarens are running great on fuel. They had the best fuel performance it looks like of the entire field, uh, so they were looking great. And then, so essentially the cars were running about every 30, 33 laps on a, on a fuel run. So they're, you know, five, five pit stops in the race. Well, there was a, a yellow that came out on like lap 151. So then it became a situation of, do you pit under yellow or do you not? And yeah, there were the, essentially the whole field split on um, half the field went into the pits and half the field stayed out. So you ended up in the situation where, um, so I got a question. I was going to say, and which strategy ended up being the one that paid off? Uh, it, the end, it didn't matter. Uh, but it, was, but it was getting, but it was really interesting there for a couple of moments. I forget, I forget who went where, but I know Pato Award went on. He had a problem where they weren't actually able to get full fuel in the car, so this actually that yellow at 151 played right into his hands. So he went into the pits to to fuel up, and the all the other cars stayed, or the other half of the field stayed out. So then around lap 171, everybody was doing lap 170, everybody was doing kind of their last round of pit stops. And you had all the people who didn't pit under yellow come in, pit, come out. And then about 10 laps later is when you had like Patio Ward go in and he came out right in the mix. He went from like being 10th all the way to third just on like this, this wow. alternate strategy. So it worked out very well. And then um, what Felix Rosenquist got a little loose and, uh, crashed and caused uh, somebody else to crash and the tire to go careening t- past the grandstands. Fortunately, that was terrifying to watch. Uh, you sent me the footage of the uh, the car that got impacted by the tire. Surprisingly, yeah. uh, not as much damage as I thought there would have been. But also, yeah, it it was unclear whether it was a direct hit or or a glancing hit, or, or if it had bounced first and then hit the car. Indeed. Yeah, but it was that was a terrifying moment for uh, for I think a lot of people watching the race because I, I scrolled through Twitter at that point in time and all the comments I seemed to see were like, yeah, but what about the tire? And yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was insane to watch. Um, and then so at that point, uh, under the IndyCar rules, they try to end on green flag racing. So if they're so inside like 15 laps or so, they'll actually red flag the race to clean everything up. So they red flag the race, right. clean everything up, get they go back out. And then immediately, uh, Pato Award tries to, uh, he, he gets, did he get overtaken? I forget exactly what happened. But um, he and Marcus Erickson were going at it, and they touched, and he went spinning into the wall. So then we had another red flag oh, conditions. Uh, so now we're like six laps to go, and they get set up to do another restart. And then you have um, 
Erickson leading it out with uh, what Joseph Newgarden right behind him. And then on that restart on the home straight, there was a crash. So now you have another red flag and then there's two laps to go. And they just said, okay, well, instead of two laps behind the safety car, we're just gonna do one lap and one lap of green flag running. So it's like, okay, so they clean everything up. They do one lap of green flag running. Joseph Newgarten comes around to Erickson on the back straight. Erickson can't come past on the uh, the home straight. And uh, Pen- Team Penske's going to Team Penske. They're never ones to count out at, at the Indy 500 for sure. So where, where did the McLaren end up in the end? Uh, I think, let me see where the highest place McLaren was. Because you said Pato Award had crashed out. He did crash out. Felix Rosenquist crashed out. I think Rossi was probably going to be the next highest one at maybe fourth or fifth. Yeah, Al- uh, Alexander Rossi would have been fifth in the McLaren, which, you know, isn't winning, but they were they were on the pace all weekend. It looked it looked really good. It does it does feel, as my little non-expert in IndyCar, that a top five finish in IndyCar is almost more significant than a top five finish in F1 especially at something like the Indy 500. Yeah, I would say that's definitely true. Um, yeah, because it's it's you're getting your name out there. And you're one to watch in the future, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it was okay, a, so that's the Indy 500. Yeah, it was a relatively calm race until it wasn't. And then it got a little crazy and chaotic, which I appreciate Indy making um, no, making no mistake of or not trying to make any apologies of we are trying to be entertainment. I, I think that's great. Yeah. Like, unlike sometimes formula one is like no we're not doing this for entertainment does something for entertainment um so i i like that at least indycar has the has the uh what fortitude to say yeah no that we we do this for entertainment um and and i appreciate it knows what it is yeah now that being said uh if people could behave themselves a little bit better on safety car restarts inside the last 10 laps uh i would be happier but i also understand that you know, if you win one race in your your IndyCar career, and that is the Indy 500, you are famous for forever. Both legs of the motor racing triple crown. When is the other leg of the triple crown, and why isn't it held on the same weekend? <laughs> the 24-hour of the Mon? Yeah, exactly. Just, just do it, get it all over and done with all in one weekend. weekend. That, would be, that would make the triple crown even harder to win true we just make it very hard to win it all in one weekend you know who had a really good weekend to forget was the andretti's they did not have a good indy 500 they actually had two andretti cars because... run into each other in the pit lane um grosjean and i forget oh the other dear ones. yeah they they actually bumped each other in the pit lane which is not good that's uh somebody's gonna get a talking to on monday morning oh yeah that that was not good so yeah uh, of all the uh, famous names of American racing, uh, I'm always surprised that Roger Penske hasn't yet to be really tied to a Formula One team as of recent. Interesting. I mean, I think they are very different sports, and I think that for a team to make that shift, like it requires going back to first principles, and I suspect at the end of the day, Americans like success, and they don't like being stuck at the back and willing not to commit tens of billions of dollars in an attempt to win and therefore it's not very interesting uh, i would i would probably definitely agree with that given that he is the penske team is very successful in indy car racing and they are very successful in like american sports car racing that like why do we need to go over and play with the europeans mm-hmm. we're doing a great job here in our sustainable business exactly exactly wrapping up the indy 500 yeah i think so um okay I, I do like one thing I do like about the Indy 500 is how they're just they also make no bones about it of like we keep trying to wrap it up and you keep going know, back to it yeah it's great because they just say you know what we're gonna make May all Indy 500 like we're gonna qualify on a weekend we're gonna do practice sessions throughout the week you can change your car however you want so like you can set up for quality and then like migrate a little bit to the race it's just like it's a it, it is definitely a spectacle and it's it's very fun it, it'd be very interesting to like granted it would be hell if monaco was like the whole month of may i'm trying to think of like the f1 race that like yeah but the funny thing about that is if you live in monaco it's three months of this except it's just different sports because what was it three weeks ago was formula e they've got the historic races coming up soon there's another one that does this porsche thing that does the thing around it and it's apparently it's just a nightmare if you live there you basically leave for three months because it's a nightmare well if you live there you probably have the money to leave for three months indeed exactly okay I mean, you're probably just there to spend the... 
Oh, sure. I don't think we have. I, do we have any spicy hot takes? No. <laughs> Not really. We do not have any spicy hot takes, which is why we should move on to them, because then we can move on to the wrap-up and the crazy but plausible predictions. Monaco will not leave the F1 calendar for 10 years. There's my spicy hot take. Didn't it just sign for 10 more years? Yeah, something like that, probably. Okay, great. Uh, so I do have some crazy predictions for next week. Uh, one is that someone is going to shoot out of the new penultimate corner at Barcelona and stick it at full tilt into the barrier. Um, because they got rid of the chicane, and so now you really can go full tilt and round that final corner and carry the speed, and somebody's going to overcook it. Well, that'll be exciting. And it'll be interesting to see what actually happens, because that, that final chicane was just a total disaster. I don't think they did anybody any good. Do, do you um, want to even go crazier and specify which driver on what lap? No. No, no I don't know. I, 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 I will only be able to make that prediction after I've seen free practice. So... Uh, my second prediction is that Alonso will win on the home turf. He Ooh. will he will have the home turf advantage that will make him win. That's bold. Does Aston Martin have any upgrades coming? I don't know. Is Max but sick? I still... <laughs> no, but I think the hmm. home turf advantage may play into his 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 uh, uh, his luck. Uh, and I think you have the next one. I do. I think Mercedes is going to end up on the podium. I completely disagree. I am pretty sure the car is no better and is unchanged, and therefore they'll be in fifth and sixth. I, I think they have so much data around Barcelona from all their years being at Barcelona that even with the new regulations compared to the old regs, I think I think they might pull something out. Or but, See, that's what happened last year. If they, they outperformed in Barcelona because it was so easy for them to nail, and therefore I think this year... They're going to outperform the car, but not everybody. But everybody else will also be very good this year because they will have brought a bunch of upgrades, and it's going to be a disaster. Well, not a disaster. It's just going to be the more of the same. However, we have a very dominant team that's yet to lose a race going to Spain, and two teammates who are one and two in the drivers' title. Does one dip it on the grass out of like say turn four or five? You're making the assumption that Perez will actually qualify in the top ten. That's true. I think he will. He will bin it again. You think he'll bin it again? Well, this is what happened last year. He went through the first, you know, few races, and then he started binning it at race after race after race. And so he's going to bin it in qualifying again. Okay, well then, is this the hot spicy take rumor of, can Perez not handle the pressure of being a world driver champion contender? He's not even a world driver championship contender, so he totally can handle it. He's, he's not number got two in the standings? It's it's race six. He, uh, it, 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 Everybody was writing the column inches for weeks about this because he happened to do well at a few races and Max was, you know, not feeling the vibe that week. It, Perez is not is not worthy of consideration into World Drive Champion. The only reason he will become second this year, if it happens, is because Alonso does not have a good performance through the rest of the year because Aston Martin screwed up the car. I mean, Alonso is only 12 points down on Fernando. <laughs> or, I'm um, sorry, yeah. I mean... Fernando is only 12 points down on Perez. It could happen. Indeed. And so I, I'm convinced that, that Perez is just going to slide down the standing to th third or fourth this year. Shall we wrap up? Uh, I think so. Um, however, we didn't talk anything about the constructor standings. And uh, did did Mercedes do themselves a disservice by beating the Ferrari's hand this weekend? You, you it's, it's very important how you phrase that you phrase that as did Ferrari, did mercedes do something to improve their standing and the answer is no they didn't did ferrari do something to harm their standings yes who needs more development mercedes or ferrari mercedes then then they did themselves a disservice this weekend by beating the ferrari you 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 saying they should have they should have intentionally performed even worse than they had been previously. Tank for tunnel time, Dominic. Tank for tunnel time. Okay. If, if um, you don't I'm know not, how your I'm car works, sure. you, you need that tunnel time. Okay. I'm not sure I would agree with that, but uh, such is life. Mercedes are still number three in the uh, uh, Constructors' Championship, so there's still a chance. They're, they're one point behind Aston Martin. They're Blimey. One. Well, that's because all, like... <laughs> So as much as, uh, yeah, that's because of the 120 points that Aston Martin has scored, 93 of them are Fernando. 
I see. Yeah. Fernando carrying the team as always. That's what he used to do. He's going to keep on doing it. Yeah. I, I think, man, I, I don't know how much longer Lance is going to last if, if Aston Martin is truly on the pace. He's got broken wrists. That's all it is. That's his, that's his excuse for the rest of the season. Yeah, that can't be the excuse as we go into, like, August. Well, breaking a wrist is a significant medical event. It takes time to recover. Yeah, six weeks. Once again, thanks for listening to Tinfoil Helmets. Uh, if you want to provide us some feedback, fe please feel free to write in at feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com. Let us know your conspiracies, your wants, needs, desires for this podcast. And also, don't forget to tell your friends to listen. Like, subscribe, rate us. We don't care. Just keep listening and we'll keep making weird comments about Formula One.